Monica. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we are both very honored and humbled to be asked to present here at the project directors meeting. And we really thank Deputy Director Melody Musgrove and Ruth Ryder, Deputy Director Larry Wexler, Director of uh, Research for Practice, and Renee Bradley, as well as the Planning Committee and the numerous project officers that we've worked with and had the opportunity to gain insights from throughout our careers, as well as AIR for their never-ending support with all of the meetings. And when I say we, I really uh, mean Tom and I. And Renee kind of gave you a prelude to one of the things I was going to say, because we met in graduate school at Arizona State University. And we actually became very interested in the similar types of research projects as graduate students and then became life partners, which as you know, has challenges and tribulations along life and career. Um, and actually, let me see if this works. I have this cartoon to sort of say what we went through at the time. It says, when we decided to get married, we said, do you know that it's going to be hell for some university to hire both of you? <laughs> and we did, but um, it was not easy, as you know, if any of you are trying to find two positions in exactly the same field at a time. But I also want to say that Tom and I are products of OSEP funding and have benefited from this. And I would not be here today if I had not received a federal fellowship for my master's degree in early childhood special education and funding for a PhD at Arizona State University and a doctoral leadership grant um, where I had a teaching assistantship for three years. And then I had a postdoc following my PhD at Utah State University on the Early Intervention Research Institute, which was funded by OSEP. And then my faculty position at Utah State was a personnel prep funding for teaching all of the BD classes. So that started my career. And I would not be here if it weren't for OSEP. And I owe my entire career for them for providing the funding and the foresight for funding students and research and opportunities for people to learn. And Tom is the same way in terms of that. I also need to say that we thank the numerous people, before I get into my research interests, but we've collaborated over the years with numerous students at universities across Utah State University, Purdue University, Arizona State University, and most recently, George Mason University. And actually, hundreds of thousands of also children with disabilities and without disabilities around the country and their parents who have agreed to participate in our research projects. I would not have anything to say today if it had not been for all of those collaborations. So we really thank all of the collaborators and especially the students and their parents who enabled them to participate in research projects and allow us to learn from them. Because what we're going to talk about are things that we learned from working with these children over the years. My original research ideas actually came from my failures as a special ed high school teacher in Massachusetts in 1976. And I remember one boy who was a senior that said to me, "Don't something like this, I can't remember the exact wording, but the essence is there and you'll hear it. Don't you try to teach me how to read. Everybody has tried to do that and nobody can do it, so leave me alone. And I was flabbergasted because I thought I should be able to teach this boy to read. He was a senior reading on a first grade level. It was heartbreaking to me to hear him even say something like that. And I think that challenge of how do I teach somebody? They deserve this. It echoes what Melody just was up here presenting. The children deserve more than what we've been giving them in the past. So I feel that a lot of what we did came from my experiences as a failure as a classroom teacher. And also Tom's experiences working on an Indian reservation and then in a separate setting school for children with emotional disabilities. And I need to say that I'm going to present some of these things that we did that got us started. And I'll go over those. They really, we learned the entire time. It's not just one thing that we started with, but we learned every single time we worked on a project. And then Tom is going to take the stance of, OK, where are we in the field and where are we going? And what have we learned from this? And where are we headed? Do we have any insights that will help us be more successful for the future? And you folks, I'm sure, are the ones that are going to do it, just like my doctoral students sitting over there from George Mason University that are funded on a leadership grant from OSEP, are the ones that are going to take steps forward for this. So our research interest really came down to questions and answers. Why can't these kids learn? 
How can we study them and learn so that we can teach them better? I love teaching, and I was very frustrated not being able to see success with kids. Very, very frustrated. And how can we teach them if we do find ways to do it? How can we help them learn faster so that they can be better and more successful in school? And then we got into cognition and learning research, looking at that, memory enhancing strategies, science education, looking at social learning and literacy, test taking skills and research synthesis. And here's a few memorable examples as I kind of go along. Tom's dissertation pointed out that what students did was more important than how they were labeled. Gats, I feel like I'm really segueing nicely with what Melody was saying. And then my dissertation looked at students with learning disabilities learning as mnemonic strategies. And I was flabbergasted that they learned as much as they did. And so was my dissertation committee. So that does taught us, you know, we're on to something, we need to pursue these more to figure out how we can look at things. And those kinds of replications and extensions sort of sustained us through our career. And as you can see with the cartoon, under strict laboratory conditions, research concludes that in spite of being watched, pots do eventually boil. So we see some of that in there. And when we moved on to Utah State University, I have to say this is really kind of interesting to me because I took a postdoc position and my first office was a bathroom. My students have heard this because I said I hope they do better than I did when I graduated. And so I thought this cartoon was perfect because here we promised you a big lab and they give you a dog and they come up with that. But I, what I learned at that university was that I worked with Carl White and Glenn Casto who were fabulous at directing the Early Intervention Research Institute and we learned research synthesis. And after the first meeting that we had with the advisory board, the group meta-analysis was criticized for not including single subject research. So Carl and Glenn turned to Tom and I and said, okay, this next year, your task is to come up with a way to synthesize single subject research. So being fresh out of graduate school, we were told something to do. We said, okay, and went to our offices to try to figure out something. And that's when we came up with the PND, which is still evolving over time with new and different methods. But there have been over 50 studies with the PND published at this point. And hopefully the field will evolve to an even better research method on it. And then we moved on to Purdue University after that, where we did a lot of research in mnemonic strategies, cognitive strategies, and science education was a wonderful opportunity for us. And I don't know if Tom Hanley is here, but he was our project officer for cooperative agreement, and he really pushed us to learn an awful lot more than we ever anticipated we would, right into qualitative research for the first time. And when I think about the things with this, I'm gonna to touch upon just some of the examples that we were able to pursue. In teaching vocabulary, and this was in, a, I think, a third grade classroom, um, we were working on the vocabulary where kids needed to learn the words that went along with the story, and jettison was one of the vocabulary words. So as part of our research project, we said, well, they probably don't know that word. So jettison means throw overboard. And what I'm showing you in the slide here is an example of a simple flashcard with the word and its definition. And that was one of our treatment conditions, sort of what we call the traditional method. And this one was another example of a different condition where we had pictures to go along with the definition. So you can see jettison, throw overboard, same definition for the top part. But what you see here also in the picture is that there's a picture depicting something being thrown overboard. Okay, so that was the second condition. The third condition was a mnemonic condition. And you notice, I can go back and forth here, the only difference between these two, you see the word jet in parentheses? That was the key word that we taught the students to learn the word jettison. That's the only difference. So we would say in learning the word jettison, think of the word jet and remember this picture of a jet throwing things overboard to help you remember the definition of jettison means throw overboard. And we were surprised at how well this kind of simple strategy would work when teaching children unfamiliar information. This was actually done in an inclusive classroom and the students did very, very well, but the special ed students benefited even more than the general ed students. We went on with a lot of mnemonics research and I put this particular slide up here because I really, I grew up in Massachusetts, so New York was always a bigger, larger state for me. And so it, having a, a, the strategy to teach the states and capitals of the keyword for New York is new pork and the keyword for Albany is all baloney. So someone going to a store saying, is this 
new pork? And they say, no, it's all bologna for that. And the reason we taught states and capitals, you might say, why did you pick that out? Well, when we were at Purdue University, every eighth grader needed to pass a test on learning the states and capitals. And they started in September. Every Friday, students would take that test. As soon as you passed it, you didn't have to do states and capitals anymore. Well, guess who was still taking the test in May? The special education students. I mean, talk about time and instructional time. But so we came up with a lot of these strategies and taught the students, and they learned it very rapidly. So there's a time and a place for these. We found in the mnemonic strategies, we found over and over significant gains across a variety of topics and integrated within content areas and not just isolated across. But you can see on the slide from English vocabulary all the way down to chemistry, some of these kinds of topics were taught. And actually, we had so much fun doing this because when the kids learned, they had what we called a mnemonic look because they'd get everything correct and they weren't quite sure how they got it correct, but they did. So it was a lot of fun. So we had over 34 experiments in this area with over 2,000 participants with a mean effect size of 0.162 on the criterion reference measure. So it was really, we saw some pretty powerful gains. And then as we kind of segued into science, I can start about this, and I'll give you the overview of what we did, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we learned. But we had over 560 participants in our science studies with over 16 qualitative and quantitative studies with experiential learning and guided learning and a couple cur curriculum analyses. And we found that the overall effect size for hands-on learning versus textbook-based learning was 1.14, again, which is a pretty significant effect size, but again, on criterion reference measures. And one of the things that we learned in a, one of our first studies in studying, and this was part of a qualitative study in a school in Illinois that had a hands-on approach to teaching science and included all students with disabilities in those classes, was there was a classroom with a child who was totally blind, and the teacher suggested, because it was a microscope unit, kind of a small thing, so you had to use microscopes, that maybe to, the child would do better not being in science during that unit. Well, the child's mother said, I don't think so. I want my child in that class, which forced the school and teachers to come up with alternative ways of thinking about using a microscope unit with someone who couldn't see. And that actually opened up a lot of channels for thinking about adaptations and accommodations for children with disabilities, not just students who are visually impaired, but other disabilities as well. Because what it forced people to do is prioritize the objective. Was the objective, and again, Melody talked about prioritizing, was the objective to learn how to use a microscope, or was the objective to learn the specimen that was underneath the microscope? So some of the students also had trouble staining cells. Well, that blue dye is really hard to get just a little dab on that cell before you put it under the microscope. Maybe that wasn't as important as, again, studying the specimen and coming up with three-dimensional models and other ways to teach that. So it was a very enlightening experience and a good way for us to see how people would look at science and say, yeah, we need to prioritize the objectives because this is fun for all kids and it's a wonderful learning opportunity for them to take part in it. One of the other experiments that we placed a lot of, um, actually had so much fun doing, and this was in, the first one was in a fourth grade class in Indiana. We built these eco columns. This is a science technology for children unit that actually was developed here at the, um, not, at the Smithsonian Institute with some collaboration from local school districts and we piloted the version of materials with them. And this is made out of soda pop bottles where you, you can see in this picture, there's an aquarium on the bottom, a connector one in the middle, and a terrarium on top. And actually at Purdue, I had to collect the soda pop bottles from the women's volleyball team because they had luck. <laughs> I used to go in and get their trash after they'd have all their soda pop bottles and stuff and collect those. And the Student Council for Exceptional Children helped me cut the bottles because we didn't want the kids to cut them into the shapes that you see there. But what we did was we compared this, you can see here in this picture, one that's all built with some children at the fourth grade level. And they were taught with students with and without disabilities and compared with a textbook approach. Once the columns were all built, and that took a long time to put everything together with the aquarium and the terrarium on top, um, students got together in two groups and then made some experiments 
and predicted what would happen. So in one set of eco columns, the children would use maybe too much salt for road salt to simulate road salt. Another one would be like a vinegar solution to si simulate acid rain. And then a third one was too much fertilizer. And students would have in their group, like two groups of three would get together, so they'd have one experimental and one control column, and they'd com conduct those experiments and complete their observations on it. Well, I have some of the tests. I scanned in some of the tests, so I want to show them to you. Now, these are students with and without disabilities, and they were compared with the hands-on approach using this and a textbook approach. And so maybe you can help me figure out, because I forget, it was a while ago, whose test this is, what condition. Okay, so here's an item. How can acid rain affect an ecosystem? You may include a picture in, in your answer. It would pollute everything. How do you know your answer is true? I just know, okay? And then the next one is design an experiment to test whether liquid soap is harmful to an ecosystem. So this child wrote, pour it all over an insect, it would kill it. So that was an experiment. Okay, not bad. I gotta give you the next page that has this follow-up question. Now draw a picture of what your liquid soap experiment might look like. Can you see that? It has a picture of the soap with it, looks like it's a dying insect. And then predict the findings of your liquid soap experiment and describe what you might observe over time. I would hardly move and dive, but I'm sure the child meant it, right? On that, okay, how many hands up? Regular ed, special ed? Regular ed, anyone? Okay, special ed? Okay, we got a lot of abstainers. Okay, <laughs> okay, well we'll go on to the next one and you can tell me what you think for that. Here's another example. How can acid rain affect an ecosystem? Acid rain gets on the plants, the acid goes to work and starts um, with the living and makes water cloudy, okay? How do you know this is true? I know because I observe. I think that's what it was, if I recall correctly. But the next item is really gonna get you. Design an experiment. How does liquid soap harm an ecosystem? We will add 25 milliliters of the solution every day. We will observe every day and write it down. And we will compare with our control. Okay. Little difference, right, from the insect that's dying there. Okay, so now draw a picture of your liquid soap experiment. Okay, you can see the eco columns there. You see that? The liquid soap, the air, the animals, the plant, the water. One's polluted in the control. And see the liquid soap being poured in at the top? What is that? I'm not quite sure how that works. And then predict it. Predict your findings. All of the plants will burn up and die, and the animals will die. In the control, everything will be fine. Okay? Now, you can probably tell what condition was this one. Hands-on or textbook? Hands-on. Okay, now, back to the real question. Special ed or general ed for this student? Special ed? Special ed. This is special ed. The first one was general ed in the textbook condition. See the remarkable difference? I mean, this taught me so much, I can't tell you how much for this. And it was so much fun to do. So if you look at the results of the chart, the hands-on versus disabilities, the kids with disabilities thrived in the hands-on condition. They loved it and learned so much. Um, and then we moved on to George Mason, kind of the next career phase for us. And we worked a lot on content area learning and literacy. And I'm going to kind of go through this quickly because I know I think I'm a little behind in time for this. And in our differentiated middle school, okay, in our differentiated activities at the middle school level, what we designed, because these were research projects, again, most of these research projects were all funded by OSEP too. So, I owe my entire career. Actually, I owe my house to you because <laughs> that's how I paid my bills was from my funding, right? <laughs> um, so anyway, within our differentiated instruction, we had three different levels that we came up with. We thought, okay, if we're going to work on science, we were working with a large school district in the eastern seaboard. You can probably figure that out. And we picked, we, were, we had actually the curriculum unit selected for us and that was experimental investigations, which was fabulous for us. Because that unit was picked because on the year before, in the high stakes test, all of the eighth graders performed the worst on the experimental 
um, investigation unit. So they said, if you want to do research with us, you have to do it on that unit. And we said, great, that's like our favorite unit of all time. So we came up with three levels of activities. One was where students just identified the correct answer, but there were prompts within it. The second level of activity was a production response, because that's a little harder than just like identifying from a multiple choice answer. And we also had prompts in there. And then the third level was unprompted production responding. And we had board games kind of things, all in folders that we came up with that would fit within an inclusive classroom. And they were all color coded, so you had a red, yellow, and blue, and you worked with a small group of students. And we always paired, like in the previous ones, we tried to only have one student with disabilities with general ed students so that there wouldn't be an overwhelming number of students with disabilities in a group. And the same with English language learners, although in our English language learners, we found that they really wanted to work together more than with other students. So we let that happen in a lot of places. So th here's an example on the right in the picture of a matchup where you can see it would be an identification activity where they took strings and had to string the holes from side to side to the correct answer on it. And the other one we, we called Mission Impossible. We tried to make them sort of exciting names for them. And that was graphs and charts, because a big part of scientific investigation is charting and graphing. And then we also had our quantitative and qualitative research um, games and methods where they had to di identify the differences between these things. So for each one of these types of areas, we had three levels of activities building up to the independent production one. They could all be done within the practice time in the inclusive classroom for kids. And this was a checkoff kind of recording sheet we had where students would mark what activity they had worked on, the amount of time they had worked on it, and then they had to rate themselves. Did I do well? Did I did so-so? Or did I really do poorly today on it with a smile face, medium face, or a not so-so-so face on it? And we found in that particular um, set of experiments that the students did very, very well. Um, and we ha actually had significant effects, I'll show you in a minute, on um, the high stakes test, which we didn't predict afterwards. I mean, beforehand, we, had never, we never thought we would get predictions on high stakes testing at the end. So we varied that kind of activity uh, from the differentiated activities to pair tutoring formats in chemistry and different social studies areas where we also included and embedded strategies within our materials to be used or not used. If, for instance, you were struggling and you didn't have the correct response to some of the information, there was a strategy provided to help you learn it. However, if you knew the response, you skipped the strategy and went on to the next questions. So you would have discussions of after that, what else is important and can you give me examples of? So it wasn't just straight factual learning, but the, the key with this was strategies were embedded to be used or not used depending upon the, the success of the learner. There's an example. There's another recording sheet. Here's another picture of students and classes because these were done pretty much with just two in a group. And here's a summary of those 10 experiments in inclusive content learning. We had 1,128 students, 283 of which were children with special needs because they were all inclusive classes, so the numbers were smaller of special ed students. And the general ed effect sizes, if you look at this, it's kind of interesting. The special ed students had a 1.4 effect size. So you see that that's really closing the gap a lot more. The general ed students benefited with a 0.63 effect size but nowhere near as much. They didn't need as much as the students with disabilities. So that those types of differentiated activities really benefited the students with disabilities who were in those inclusive classes. So we felt pretty happy with that kind of an, a, an outcome that we saw across those studies that were replicated with all variations across science and social studies. Um, and if you look at those 10 experiences there, if you look at the change, experimental control change, you can see another way graphically of seeing the special needs students versus the general ed students and the amount of gain that special ed students had versus what general ed students had. It might point Which, a little bit toward why sometimes general ed teachers say, well, I don't really need it in my class because so there's not that much of a bump for the general ed students. They might go from a B to an A, whereas the special ed kids go from a D or a C to a B. You know, so I mean, there is a huge impact and change in learning there. 
the last project I'm going to talk about that was so much fun for me, and I don't know if Linda Mason is here, but I owe an awful lot of thanks to her for involving me in this research grant, was writing for students with emotional disabilities. And I put up this slide, I hate writing, writing and me have nothing in common, I'm not writing, because that's what one girl wrote when I was teaching them <laughs> the first day of instruction. And I said, everybody write, I had my instructions, and she wrote, I hate writing. Writing and me have nothing in common, I am not writing. And then put her head down on the desk. I mean, these are, and this is kind of embarrassing because I had my doctoral students there observing me, right? And they're gonna say like, what's Master Piri gonna do now, <laughs> you know? And so it was very, very interesting because this is a very challenging, difficult to teach population, as you guys all know. And these were students who were in a separate setting school. So it wasn't just a little, you know, off task behavior, but maybe more serious emotional problems as well. And here's another example of what happened while I was teaching. I'm going up, and Maria is not the real name, but I said, hi, Maria, do you need some help getting started? Because obviously she was sitting there and not doing what she was supposed to be doing. And she looked right at me, and she said, something smells. And I said, oh, well, let's look at your paper, trying to redirect, right? Just like I teach my students in the methods classes, redirect attention to task. So she looked right at me, and she said, no, I mean something really smells real bad. And she was looking at me. So I tried to redirect one more time. Well, what's your topic sentence? And she said, don't you get it? You smell. And I was like, <laughs> you know, so these are the things our teachers deal with every day. I mean, I was just going in for one period a day for this research project, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot, you know? Anyway, the kids, <laughs> it's, it's like that's what they deal with every single day, right? When they're working with that population or variations of that kind of thing. But what we taught the kids was basically adapted from Stephen Karen's wonderful research in SRSD writing instruction. And this is an example of the graphic organizer that we used in, the, in many of our studies over this, where you taught students to organize with the main reasons. This was to teach persuasive essay writing. So they had to come up with a topic sentence and the reasons, three or more, that, that what were the reasons that you would persuade someone, and then explain those reasons, and then have an ending and uh, wrap it up and, uh, and go through it. I'm going to show you an example, and I'm not gonna read it to you, but you can just tell from the number of words. This was a baseline test for one student. There were 78 words, and actually this is a very good one because some of the students that we worked with had like 20 words or 15 words, and these are eighth graders. So that's really not very good for the beginning eighth grader. So this one actually was one of our star pupils at, at baseline performance. And this is her second essay after treatment, 313 words, and it's good. It's really, really good. If you're interested in it, you'll be able to read it. I don't want to take the time to go through it, but the story is really compelling. A lot of the writing that the kids did was wonderful and talked about like what they would do and things. It's just the writing was just precious. But not only that, they learned. Look at this. This is across eight studies now. And most of these were single subject research studies, but the total end, when I put all the data together, were 112 students almost all eighth graders, a couple seventh graders in this study. If you look at baseline performance for essay length, we came up with an average of 61. And you look at post phase one, 156.7 words. Post phase two, phase two we either taught them to write fluently or we added in um, counter arguments. We manipulated the studies in various ways. Those 147 words, it came down a little because in fluency we only gave them 10 minutes to plan and write. So that's why that's reduced a little bit. But maintenance, 143 words, and generalization, 144 words. And some of the maintenance and generalization were taken two months following instruction, so they weren't right away. So that's really good, but what's really even more important than just the number of words, you have to say, Does the, do the words make sense, right? Because the kids can just write like garbage, right. and it doesn't mean anything. But they had the parts of the essays, if you look at that. 3.2 parts of a persuasive essay at baseline, 8.9 parts, after phase one of instruction, 9.58 after phase two, 8.25 after maintenance, that's great that they retain that many, and 8.98 for generalization. And here, the overall quality of the essay, the same way, the exact same pattern of when we scored rubrics, and we used the same scoring rubrics that Linda Mason used because she was at Penn State at the time and we were collaborating on the same research grant, so we used the same scoring rubrics. If you're interested in those, I can send them to you. Um, but there was just a, an overall 
incredible difference in terms of the writing. And so what have we learned? If I look at that kind of a general capsule of some of the things that Tom and I have worked on from 79 to 2014, besides getting older, that is prioritize instruction, adapt the instruction, systematically teach, systematically evaluate. You have to do that every single day. Teach directly and intensely the content, skills, or concepts that you want the students to learn. Teach students to attend more carefully and to think more systematically. They can do that, but you have to teach them. And they can then use that in generalization and maintenance, as you saw in the writing. And we've always seen that when you use structure, clarity, redundancy, that intensity of instruction, they don't get it necessarily one time. You have to come up with lots of opportunities for practice. Enthusiasm, appropriate pace that monitor the outcomes, that those are real keys to success, and that we learn best by doing, and that our experience informs our understanding. And that goes for Tom and I. We learned every single project we worked on. We learned just as much from what, what the kids didn't learn, we learned, and what they learned, we learned. I mean, it was just an overall learning experience. And so I would just say persevere, 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 and every day is a gift. That's why they call it the present. And now Tom's going to take over. Margaret's kind of gone through the work that we did uh, and over the last uh, 30 years or so. And I wanted to say this is kind of representative of what's happened as a field and uh, how we've all gained collectively uh, as a field. I want to talk a little bit about the state of the art in practice then and uh, now, what we have, uh, say something about attitudes then and now, and talk a little bit about uh, unresolved issues. I don't want to say where the field is going, but I would say these are the problems that we still have to deal with. And without uh, being able to say how we're going to do it, say these are the things that are probably important for us to, to consider. Uh, <clears throat> we both started in, uh, in the 1970s, right around the time, or even a little before, of the 94-142 uh, uh, being enacted. And at that time, where we were was uh, process assessment and training was was uh, very big, uh, jumping on trampolines and doing angels in the snow, uh, and uh, doing patterning procedures with your arms and legs uh, with theoretically based instructional models where people would have a theory and then they would apply that theory and people would come in. Uh, and Newell Kephart, Barsh, Doman Delicato, and a bunch of others that had these, these reason through approaches. But we were only seeing the beginnings of applied behavior analysis uh, and the direct instruction, and even then not as much in the special ed area, although we were seeing some of it. Uh, there was only very beginning work in attention, memory, cognition, those sort of cognitive areas that was just beginning to get a foothold there in, in, uh, in terms of the behavioral approaches and the beginnings of a real professional literature. And I remember in my uh, master's program, <laughs> we had a methods book, and I was, I was glad to have the book because there really were very few back then, uh, but the methods book, when we talked about reading, it just sort of said, well, there's this approach, and there's that approach, and there's the other approach, and there's the other approach, and it said nothing about efficacy. It just said these were things you could do. Uh, when it came to, <coughs> to language, I was interested to read 60 pages on language development uh, and not a word about what you do about improving language for kids who didn't develop so well. So those were the kind of things we were faced on. There just simply wasn't a knowledge base of effective practice, although they were the beginnings of some. Now we flash forward to the 2010s. Today, now we have a focus on evidence-based practice, a real uh, emphasis area to be sure that the, what we're claiming is supported by very positive evidence, a focus on authentic tasks and real life uh, settings, whereas some of the better work that was being done even back in the 70s was on experimental tasks and experimental settings. We've seen an explosion of research in cognitive and behavioral domains, <coughs> just literally an enormous amount of research. And because of that, We've uh, seen develop some new techniques for synthesizing research with meta-analysis and different ways to combine outcomes to decide what's happening over large numbers of studies. We've had new instructional practices, for example, RTI, and we've had a large professional literature on best practice. So we're so much better off today that, than we were. I just want to show you a little graphic here. Um, and this is only from a quick look at Google Scholar. There's other ways to look at this, but if I, I Googled um, on, on the Scholar site, Applied Behavior Analysis and Disabilities in 1970 and then years up to 2014, and Cognitive Strategies, and I found 43 and 66 on those two topics. 
in uh, night and before 1970 and today 24,000 uh, of ABA and about the same with cognitive strategies of which you know, we've contributed an extraordinarily modest proportion of what's gone on but I think what we've done over the years has sort of paralleled what we've learned in uh, in uh, special education. We've also made enormous uh, improvement in the growth of inclusive classrooms. These are some data from OSF, uh, which shows that uh, presently we've had uh, an increasing trend toward more and more inclusive classes, and this is generally regarded as a very positive outcome. Um, and on time graduation rate, you can see the students with disabilities, even though it's not what we'd hoped to be, is still quite a bit better over time than it was in the past. So I think there's some things that have gone on, like first of all, the, the expansion of the knowledge base and the beginnings of improvement of inclusion and graduation for students with disabilities is a, a very, very positive thing. On the other hand, some things have not changed much, and I want to talk about some research synthesis projects that we've worked on over the last couple of decades. <clears throat> I was wondering about this when I was reading in textbooks that said, okay, attitudes towards disabilities, attitudes toward inclusion are improving over time. And I thought, well, how, how do we know that? What can we, what can we do to find out if that's actually true? So what we did was a research synthesis, but on survey research. We wanted to look at what are the survey outcomes and how have they changed over time. And the first one we did was in 1996, and we went back to 1958, where the first uh, discussion of this was not complete, but it was there, uh, and up until the present, uh, at that time, it was the present 1998. And I'll show you what we found. Um, what we did was we looked at the, for the outcome metric was the percent of people who agreed to the statement, right? So, if it, we, so we lined up similar questions over the years and said, how did people respond to these? And uh, what we found in the 1995 to 1996, 1958 to 1996 survey, uh, that 62.8% supported, that was about 10,500 teachers that were surveyed in that period across 28 surveys. About 62% supported the concept of inclusion, and about 61% said they were willing to teach students with disabilities. Uh, after, in the last uh, few years, I decided, well, I wonder if that's changed any more since then. And so we surveyed, we collected all those surveys that had been done since 1997, and we ended up with 40 of them, uh, with a total of about 8,000 teachers. And uh, I didn't, we didn't publish the, uh, research because I got sick, <laughs> but I got better, and uh, I can show you some of the data that we've collected. Now, overall, the support the concept of inclusion, 1996, 20, 2010, 65%. This was over 8,000 teachers in 40 surveys. Willing to teach students with disabilities, 54.4%. So we're seeing really pretty much the same numbers in this last 15 years as we saw in all that time before that. And what we did find, though, that was different was higher agreement for more generally worded items of less intensity. I'll show you what that mean by that in just a second. Uh, a generally worded item would be, well, I support mainstreaming. It's, I think it's okay to have kids in the class sometimes. And the strongly worded was like total integration is what we really need to strive for. We need every kid in every class all the time. Or things that are sort of like that. And here's what we found if I break it down on this chart. Uh, each of these dots is a separate survey that was taken and it's years across the years on the bottom. And you can see there's some variability there. And each one is the percent that agreed to this statement. I support inclusion or mainstreaming for students with disabilities. And so what you see is that uh, there's a lot of variability over time, but it's kind of hard to make out a particular trend. And we couldn't find any difference by uh, region of the country. We thought some parts of the country might think differently about this. We didn't find any difference by the reliability of the survey or the end of the survey or where it was done or who collected it or where it was published. So we wanted to see what is it that discriminates at all between uh, these responses. And finally, what we saw was uh, how was the item worded? The generally worded strategy is in the red and the strongly worded, in other words, we need realistic integration of all students, is in the yellow. And if you see it broken down this way, you see a trend that's going nowhere uh, across all those years, uh, but it stays about the same, that teachers are willing to support in, uh, inclusion to a certain extent, but they're a little more concerned about uh, 
total integration. Uh, this is the one we did last time, which is 1997 to 2010. Kind of chopped the top off of that. And it's more surveys, and it's even more variability, but we saw exactly the same thing when we said, I'm generally supportive of including students with disabilities. We see about that same number. But in either case, uh, there's not a lot of progress. And this is kind of interesting in a way because we've seen enormous progress. And for example, uh, in 1958, there was like 4 to 6% of the population supported interracial marriage. And today, it's in, in the high 80s or 90s. So we've seen enormous change in attitude that way. Uh, with respect to gay marriage, it's been about the same thing. It was, it was uh, much lower years ago, and it's becoming much more accepted today. But, but this is not. And uh, let me show you this. Here's the support. Here's the summary of two censuses efforts. The yellow is 1971 to 1996, and the red is 1997 to 2010, support for inclusion. Generally worded and strongly worded, they're almost exactly on target the same way. So that's not changing. Well, why not? Well, I don't think that teachers are regarding this as a kind of a social epiphany. I don't think it's a matter of enlightenment, you know, that we're looking at in terms of like gay marriage or interracial marriage or something like that, where people are just becoming more enlightened about their attitudes. I think it's teachers having a job to do and thinking what are, the what are the requirements on me and what are the demands on the job. And we talked about the extent of mainstreaming and the severity of the student. They're thinking more, this is more and more responsibility on me that I don't know that I'm prepared to, uh, to accept or to, to accomplish successfully. And I think that's the way they're looking at it, not in terms of are we just having some attitudes. And I'll show you these other things. These are some other things that haven't changed a whole lot. We said, do you have enough time do you have enough training or do you have enough support? The teachers have, were asked this uh, in many surveys over all these years, and you can see, again, the yellow is the, the older surveys and the red are the newer surveys. Uh, I don't know if you can make real precise comparisons because these are all different surveys across all different things, but what you're seeing is the numbers are about the same. Uh, in fact, teachers have a little bit more. They're responding a little bit better to training. I think the training is a little, a little bit, bit better, and they're feeling a little bit more supported but if anything, they feel like they have even less time to accomplish these things. And I think that's probably at what we're getting at when we see these attitudes about how willing are you to do this. And they're thinking, well, how much support am I going to get? And I think that support for inclusion and attitudes toward inclusion are going hand in hand. And that's something we need to be thinking about for the future. Okay, uh, now for some unresolved issues. These are the things that we need to think about in the future that I don't have the answers to, but uh, somebody else can re answer them, that would be really good. I do have some questions and some issues that I think we need to all think about. Uh, one is delivery of instruction. How will instruction be delivered? The other is inclusive learning of common core curriculum versus intensive individual instruction in targeted need areas, and how will those be reconciled? Uh, the other is the role of the special ed teacher in an inclusive classroom. Uh, the next is inclusive instruction. Um, and RTI, and can we view them as exclusively special education undertakings? I'm going to suggest no, we cannot. And the need for more ideas. So I'll talk about these. Instruction be delivered in special education. Now I have two big concerns about this. When the individual need area is not taught in the special ed classroom, for example, speech and language, if other kids don't have a need for instruction in this area, study skills or organizational skills or social skills, kids do not really need uh, instruction in this, how will that instruction be delivered? And in basic reading skills, and I think you talk about some basic content understandings in the high school and secondary level, when reading was a part of the curriculum but it no longer is, how are we going to continue that, that instruction? How are people going to deal with that? And we need to have some kind of formalized way of saying, this is the way we think is the best way to proceed. And, uh, and have some guidelines rather than just a case-by-case -case basis. The other is, when, teach, when students can learn the curriculum, they're willing, they're able to master it with partic particular strategies, but when part of those strategies are they need more time, they need more intense instruction, they need a more deliberate pace. Uh, I remember even when I, was, uh, when I was working on a reservation in southern uh, Arizona, and I was trying to get my kids integrated. I had a, a class of students with mild disabilities uh, and mild intellectual handicaps, and I was trying to <coughs> help get them integrated, and I went first to an art class. I thought, okay, well, 
That was typical in those days. They say, oh, art and music, we'll put the kids into those. And part of the reason was we don't really care very much about these things anyway, so it's a good place to put them. Uh, and I went with them, and I saw that the pace of instruction was unbelievably fast. I mean, this art teacher, she did one thing, and she was on to a completely different topic the next day, and the next day, and the, the students that I had uh, were getting nothing out of it. So I began to teach them, you know, this is the vanishing point. This is, this is the way you can draw a landscape. You know, and we did it over and over and over and over again, and they were able to recapture the understandings that were being presented in that class. But more recently, um, this is the, the studies that Margo was talking about with, with uh, SRSD writing for students with emotional and behavior disorders, and some of these kids were pretty seriously uh, involved. Uh, but this is what was happening. That instruction took place on an average of 12 weeks of just doing persuasive essays. It was 10 to 55 sessions, four to five days a week, 30 to 45 minute sections, sessions, writing practice throughout the instruction, and small group instruction with two or three or even individuals sometimes, and the kids wrote 12 to 20 essays. And they came out pretty good and pretty competent, although they didn't have the, the spelling and the mechanics down, but they had the idea of writing and how you write a persuasive essay. They also, as kids with emotional disturbance, had new insights on uh, how do you take the perspective of someone else? How do you argue rationally for your point rather than just thinking of uh, obstructive ways to, to accomplish the same thing? Now, on the other hand, the general ed curriculum specified three to five days for persuasive essays, and this also included grammar, syntax, language usage. And, and they only wrote two complete persuasive essays during the unit, and they used whole class instruction. So, yes, they can learn it. Yes, it's the curriculum. Yeah, general ed curriculum, yes, they can do it. But how do you reconcile these issues of pace and intensity? Everybody in the class doesn't need that level of pace. Everybody in the class doesn't need that level of intensity, but these kids did. Uh, and part of the thing that might make it a little bit easier is saying that there wasn't a whole lot of systematic instruction for these kids up until eighth grade in the area of persuasive writing. So maybe if it were integrated in the curriculum more when they were younger, it would be a little bit easier. But even so, uh, this is something that needs to be resolved. Uh, the next thing is, <laughs> Uh, how is instruction going to be delivered? And I want to talk a little bit about uh, a synthesis we did of qualitative research when we were interested very much in co-teaching and we wanted to see how is it maintaining itself and what are people thinking about co-teaching and how is it actually working in the class in practice. And so we found 32 qualitative investigations and mostly they were researchers who'd followed around uh, uh, classrooms where co-teaching was being implemented and they did uh, field notes and direct observations, they did interviews, they looked at artifacts, and they combined it and they, and they came up with their conclusions. And we found 32 qualitative studies like this, and we used those 32 as informants into a larger database of what do people think about inclusive instruction. It ended up being uh, 453 co-teachers, 112 students, and 42 administrators. <coughs> and we found that most participants favored co-teaching, they spoke pretty highly of it. Uh, however, this is what we also found, and this is more of a concern. Whole class teacher-led instruction dominated. The special ed teacher was often looked at as an aide or a subordinate to the classroom. The, the classroom would pretty much stayed the way it was with just the te special ed teacher find, trying to find a place in there. And the content knowledge was a challenge to the special ed teacher if they didn't feel like they were up to the general ed teacher's level of content knowledge. Um, and what we saw also was that specialized instruction or learning strategies were almost never observed. And what we concluded in the article, practices known to be effective and frequently recommended, peer mediation, strategy instruction, mnemonic, study skills, training, organizational skills, hands-on curriculum materials, testing skills, comprehension training, self-advocacy training, self-monitoring, or even general principles of effective instruction were only rarely observed. Uh, and that's discouraging because you feel like, you know, OSEP and other agencies have funded all of this research that we've developed, strategies that we know are very helpful and they're just simply not being used as much in the general ed class. And partly the reason may be because of what Margo said, many kids learn pretty quick, pretty readily without these things. Anyway, to be more specific about these, these uh, issues, I want to talk about some of the original findings from the original qualitative studies that we synthesized to put this together. Uh, the role of special education teacher was often as a behavior management or to uh, to be an assistant in the classroom. And here's some comments that we see. Uh, this is from a teacher's journal uh, from a dissertation. Michael presents many challenges. The fear of the other students is real, and I will pledge to keep them safe. 
Mary will restrain and remove him while I continue with the rest of the class. It has taken its toll on all of us. Well, guess who Mary is? Uh, another behavior management. The general ed teacher actually presents the informa lesson information while the special ed teacher stands off to one side and focuses most of her attention on monitoring the behavior of three of the seven LD students. Uh, this is, uh, next is from uh, Field Notes. After Janet completes the call, she starts collecting the homework. Occasionally during the lecture, Janet would interject a comment to the class. At one time she said, remember when we talked about what enzymes did? This is another uh, uh, researcher conclusion. Because whole class instruction continued to be the norm, special ed teachers had very few opportunities to offer individual instruction. Here's one from uh, an interview. The first year I was a model for the students. Often if the subject teacher is lecturing, I would do the notes on the overhead projector to model note taking. Uh, from uh, dissertation, this was a uh, field notes. In a first grade class, a general ed teacher led the class in a song while the special ed teacher moved about the room organizing the chairs and picking up materials that were out of place from the previous activity. And these weren't, these aren't random, but they're not cherry picked. Okay, I'm almost done anyway, Renee. <laughs> um, uh, Naomi Zygmunt and Matta concluded none of, this is a, a study of a whole bunch of secondary math classes. None of what we saw would make it more likely that the students with disabilities in the class would master the material. We virtually never saw the special ed teacher provide explicit strategic instruction to facilitate learning or memory of the content material. Uh, and that's pretty much what I think we have to work on if they're going to be in the general ed classroom as they ought to be by, by many accounts. Uh, we need to find a way to accommodate this and to find a way to get them a special education while they're still in that general ed setting. Um, another point I wanted to raise is that inclusive instruction in RTI cannot be viewed as essentially a special education undertaking. And this is part of the problem that I think we've seen in the co-teaching issues. Uh, in a search of Google Scholar and SSCI Web of Science, just for a little redundancy, I looked at the percentage of RTI articles in general ed journals and the percentage of RTI articles in special ed journals or school psych, ed psych journals. And what we found by Google Scholar was that 14% of the RTI articles appeared in general ed journals and 86% appeared in special ed or general ed journals. With uh, SSCI, it was about the same, 22% versus 78%. The lion's share, the really dominant share of research and academic presentation is going on in the general ed, in the special ed and uh, ed psych, school psych journals. And this suggests that there's a real ownership issue here that I think we have to think more about. And even worse than this, I think a very substantial number of the RTI articles in general ed journals were written by special ed people uh, who were invited to say something about it. So I, I don't know that the general ed community is really on board with this or sees it as their issue as much as they probably ought to. And this is uh, one concern that I wanted to mention. It's just a puzzle that occurred to me a while ago. Let's say we're in a general ed classroom and we're going along and here's some kids that are having some real specific school problems. Okay, so for them we give systematic validated tier one services in the classroom. And let's say that doesn't turn out to be good enough. That's not, uh, that's not sufficient to, to help their problem. Tier one doesn't work, so now we move to more intensive validated tier two services in or out of class where we're having very specific systematic instruction in small groups and targeted to their need areas. Now we find, if you go to the bottom, intensive tier two structures, two, tier two services don't work. We have a need for even more intensive services or special education. So we have testing, we have referral to special education. Uh, we refer as a kid and classify the kid as uh, in special education. And what we do for a placement is put him in the inclusive general ed classroom. <laughs> it looks like there's something wrong with this diagram. <laughs> and I, I think the, the, the way to approach it or the way to work on the solution for that is that when that second time he gets placed in the general ed classroom, that has to be very different. It can't be what we were doing in the first place. There has to be some things going on of the kind that we've worked on in inclusive settings in our own careers and uh, the work that other people have done. But I think with more ownership by, by general education uh, and more ownership by the, by the general ed teacher and more intensive work in areas that are actually very helpful to students with special needs, we can probably meet that, uh, meet that challenge. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that uh, I know we've had a lot of focus 
over recent years on evidence-based practice and high quality and rigorous design and rigorous data analysis in our research. And I think this is very important, and I'm completely behind it, and I think it's a good thing that we have a real emphasis on quality in our research design. We must maintain high standards of quality research. However, we must not forget the important need for new ideas to address the critical issues and challenges of today. And one example that occurs to me is a paper by Ann Brown in 1982 where she said, the three great learning theorists of the 20th century, Piaget, Binet, Skinner, used no statistics at all, none. And what they had was an idea, and what they had was ideas that really moved the field forward and helped us understand so much better child development and child learning that there's plenty of time to look at it many different ways once we have the idea. So I think continued and increased collaboration among teams of federal agencies, practitioners, researchers, and methodologists can help us address the challenges of the present and the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.